So we proceed with the second part of the lecture and we just saw the fourth type of cell side e-commerce website and that is publisher or media website where basically what a, a business would do is when they use such website is to publish either information, news or some sort of uh, entertainment so that could be a, a story or a video that would attract the traffic to that website and how they make money is through mostly through the uh, advertisements, commission based sales and sale of customer data. And then we have the last type of websites and these are social network sites. And this type of sites facilitate interaction between individuals either in a group or one on one basis and such websites provide facilities that allow people to ge generate what we call user generated content and to exchange messages between uh, individuals or comments and examples of such sites is Facebook, LinkedIn, Twitter and these are kind of uh, sites we are very much used to so I will not uh, open any example of that because we are pretty much uh, accustomed to social network sites. <laughs> now we have talked about different types of e-commerce websites that enterprises can take advantage of. Now you need to know what kind of benefits consumers are looking for on websites. <coughs> now one thing that you have to notice, those websites that we have just discussed, they are not clear cut types of websites. That it doesn't mean when you have one type of website you cannot use the other type. In most cases companies would integrate. So it could be a transactional website that also serves as a way of building the brand. Or it could be an info uh, publisher or media website that also provides some sort of relational building uh, possibilities. So in most cases there is a interaction. The, the demarcation between the websites is very blurring in, in a way. You, you can combine depending on your needs. And this brings us to the point of which benefits our target audience are looking for. On Tuesday, we talked about customer value. That in order to sell your products, you need to deliver the, product, uh, the kind of value that your target customers are looking for. And this is very much applicable to online business that there are kind of benefits that consumers are looking for. And if you cannot provide those benefits, you will literally be wiped away from business. So these are some of the benefits that usually customers are looking for. The first one is content. And what co uh, consumers are looking for is detailed, relevant, in-depth information to support customers or consumers. In the mid of 1990s, there was a phrase that says, content is the key and that phrase is still pretty much in use even today that when you have a website you have to make sure that you have the kind of content that is relevant to your target audience that is detailed that can drive people to come to your website the internet provides massive amount of information when you start moving around in, in the on the internet you can come across a lot of websites and it's, it's difficult to choose which website uh, to be, like to visit and which one not. So what attracts people to your website will be the kind of content that you are publishing on your website. So the first and foremost requirement that you need to bear in your mind is you have to publish relevant content that will attract visitors to your website. Second is customization. Now because the internet has resulted into massive information, there are a lot of irrelevant information out there. Consumers are looking for customization because this helps us to make decisions. It makes it easier when information is customized. 
So for instance, if if I log in, in into my Zalando account, I, I have an account with this side. One of the things that I would find is suggestions that they provide to me. And this is based on my previous uh, transactions, previous searches, that they, they will send you information that is specifically customized for you. They know that based on your previous transactions or previous uh, search activities, you don't like a particular brand. So for instance, they, they know you like Adidas. And based on that, they will be giving you information about Adidas new products, or based on their experience, they probably know that people that like Adidas usually would also like Jack and Jones. So whenever they have uh, news about these products, they will send it to you. And that makes it very easy because I don't need to go around and look for all the new products that they have, have come to the store. Based on, my, uh, on the suggestions that they have given to me, I can make my decision. So you need to think that when you are developing your online business, you need to bear in, in mind that <coughs> consumers like customization. Look for ways to customize information that is relevant to specific target customers. The third is community. We like to interact. We like to network with other individuals. So as an enterprise, you need to find ways to facilitate this kind of interaction. So different organizations do it in different ways. It could be through opening, your, uh, opening a Facebook account where you give an opportunity for your customers to interact between themselves, but also interact with you. But also some organizations or some enterprises even form an online brand community. For instance, Apple. Apple have a, an online community where Apple consumers can interact with one another, they can exchange information, they can share their experiences. So if you have a, a product, uh, an Apple product, and something is wrong with your product, instead of contacting the uh, Apple for support, you could first search for help in the community. And usually, there will be somebody else that has encountered a similar problem. And that is very important to, to Apple because first it helps them to reduce cost because they don't need to attend to every problem. Usually you could get help from other uh, consumers that have experienced a similar problem. And also, the fourth one is convenience. The perception is, and of course that is the truth, when we, we buy things online, one of the things we are looking for is convenience. Different from physical stores, where usually they are all open in a limited period of time or in some days are not open. Online sites usually are accessible 24 7, 365 in a year. That is, you, you can access their services or the products whenever you want wherever you want. So that point of convenience is very important. Another benefit is choice. With an online service platform, people are expecting to get a, a wider choice of products or services. Imagine a site like Amazon. They have a wide range of products. Those products could not be place in a physical store. But because the, pl the service or the, the store is online and the space is uh, almost unlimited, you can have as many products as possible. And this gives consumers with a, a wide range uh, of alternatives. So whenever you are running an online business, you need to think about the, uh, the, the, the range of options that you are providing to your customers because customers are looking for a wide choice of products or services. And the last one is cost reduction. We consumers know that a business that runs its activities online has lower operational costs than traditional businesses. So we expect when we buy things online, 
the cost will be much lower than when you buy things from a traditional store, which means if you are running an online business and your costs are higher than cost of a traditional business, most likely you will not get customers. So you need to make sure that your digital strategy helps you to lower costs so that you can offer customers with lower prices. Remember last time we talked about So last time we talked about value creation, where you say that you will incur some cost to produce goods or services for your business. And we call them cost of goods sold. And in order to make profit, you will sell them at a certain price. But consumers usually have a perception of what the product is worth. And this could be based on reference prices. For instance, these days, uh, the internet provides us opportunity to compare prices among different provi service providers. So I can look around and have a benchmark price, at least a, an idea of how much this product should cost. So in some way, I will have a perceived price. And this is what we call an incentive to purchase for a customer. Now, what we're expecting is when you adapt digital technology, your cost of production should go down, which means to maintain the same level of profit, you can also lower the, the price and keep the same margin. And this is what consumers are expecting, that once you, you have a digital business or strategy, it will help them to lower the cost. That is, they will be able to obtain the products at a lower price. And this brings us to an important point, and that is online value proposition. Remember on Tuesday we talked about value proposition, and that is a promise that an enterprise gives to its consumers, and the belief on the part of the consumers that that value will be delivered. So. It also applies to online businesses. What value are you promising to offer to your consu uh, consumers, your target audience? And based on this uh, value proposition, then you need to create a appropriate strategy for delivering that promise. So an online value proposition is a statement of, of the benefits of online services that reinforces the core proposition and differentiates from an organization's offline offering and those of competitors. So basically, it's the promise that you are giving your consumers of, of what you can offer them. I think uh, I have an example of, uh, of a value proposition. Now, this is an example of a value proposition. May, may, we can get it from their website. Now, the, the site is in Norwegian, but I've tried to translate. Uh, sorry. Yeah.
Yeah. So the original message is on in Norwegian, but uh, I will get the English version on the slide. So these guys are selling eyeglasses online. And what they are doing is they're actually based in Oslo. You can visit their website and select a pair of glasses that you would like to buy. And they send you four additional pair of glasses. You can try them, all of them, and the, you select what you are satisfied with and send back the remaining four. All of it free of charge. And if you don't like any one of them, you can return all of them without paying for anything. Have you read it? You can read the Norwegian version and then I will take on the English version. My roughly translation. I did that, so okay. So this is what th these guys are saying. They say, we believe in products of high quality design that can be sold at reasonable prices over networks. Our inspiration is the 1960s vintage look with the modern touch. Our goal is to design eyeglass models that, that will become classic over time. All our glasses are made of acetate and their frames are reinforced by steel to ensure high quality. All lenses are ground in Norway. Can you see which promises are th they are making from this statement? N number one, high quality. Reasonable price. Classic. Fourth. So that will be quality, but because it's steel, it also implies durability. It can last longer, right? Fifth, the last one. And what does that mean? It's made by Norwegians. And what does it mean when it's made by Norwegians? One, one eco friendly in a way that it's only located in one Yeah, that you could look at it in one way, eco. And what else? What reputation Norwegians have in the world? Hmm? Richest, country. Richest country in the world? Or in terms of behavior? <laughs> <laughs> Can somebody guess? Quality, I guess. Quality? Yeah. And something else? Honest. Honest. Excellent. So the last sentence summarizes everything because <laughs> Norwegians are associated with being honest. So what they say is, these products are made in Norway and whatever we promise is true because that's what Norwegians are, all right? So in the same way when they say something is from Germany, what, what do you associate with? For instance, when an engine is made in Germany, what does it tell you? Quality, strength. So this is what we call an effect of control for region that when you communicate where your product is based, it tells somebody implicitly what they should expect from that. And this is very important on online business because there is a serious issue with trust when it comes to online transactions. But people usually make some inference on who they should trust. So if your, web, your business is online and it's based in Norway, uh, People can give you some considerable 
level of uh, trust. But I'm not going to mention any uh, countries, but I know there are countries that if you see their website and they're selling something and they say they are based in that country, probably you won't even try to put in your email address, right? Because you don't trust them. So this is an example for value proposition. Dimensions of e-commerce. Now we're talking about application of information technology in executing business transactions. But these transactions could be digitized in different levels or at different levels. And therefore, there's a different forms of e-commerce depending on the, how these companies are doing their transaction. And we have three uh, important processes or activities that can determine the level of e-commerce that our, uh, uh, an enterprise has attained. And the first one is the ordering system. So how do they perform the ordering system of their products or services? How do people pay for those products? We will see it in, in a couple of seconds. Second is processing. How do they create their products? And the last one is shipment. How do you obtain the product? How do consumers receive the product or the service that they have paid for? Now each of these may be either physical or digital. And that determines the level of uh, electronic commerce that the a business is engaged in. Now in a traditional commerce, all of these three dimensions would be physical. While in a pure e-commerce, all of them will be digitized. That is, in a pure electronic commerce business, the ordering of the product, processing, shipment, everything happens online. For instance, Google. Almost all the products that we consume uh, from Google are created, delivered, we order and pay for online. So this is an example for pure electronic commerce uh, business. But if there's any one of these three activities that is done offline or physically, then that's what we call partial electronic commerce. So here is a, a, an illustration. If you put it in a three-dimension uh, diagram, the, the y-axis, oh. We hope that they will fix it by next week. There we go again. So when we look at it in a three-dimensional diagram, the y-axis represents the ordering system activity, how the ordering is done. The x-axis represents how delivery of the good or the service is done. And the z-axis represents the processing, how the product is created. If you have an enterprise where none of these activities is done online, that's what we call traditional commerce. If you have a business where all of these are done online, that's what we call pure electronic commerce. Anything in between that if 
ordering is done physically and delivery and processing uh, online, then that is partial e-commerce. If ordering and um, say delivery is done online, but processing is done physically, it's partial. And likewise, if this and this are online, but this is physically, then it's also partial. So for instance, when you buy things from Let's, let's take an example of, so you buy a jacket or a pair of shoes, and this is you, the order will be done online, right? And all the processing will be done online, but how they deliver your product Because this is a physical product, right? So you cannot deliver shoes online, or you cannot uh, deliver clothing or any fashion or lifestyle products online. They have to send it physically. For instance, here in Mali, one of the places you can collect uh, your products from Zalando is the other Ica in um, Moldova. So this aspect is physical, but this aspect is online. Then what we say, what they are doing is sort of partial e-commerce. But other companies like uh, Google, Apple, now uh, Apple also does partial e-commerce because they have physical stores and they have online stores. Most of the comp companies would fall in between. There are not so many companies that would do uh, pure e-commerce. And traditional commerce is uh, almost disappearing except we still have some micro and small medium size uh, enterprises companies that are still in the doing things in a traditional way now depending on the degree of uh, digitization we have three categories of e-commerce uh, enterprise the first one is brick and mortar brick and mortar these are the old type of uh, businesses those who are using the traditional ways, doing every of those three activities offline. And then we have virtual or pure play organizations. These are organizations that employ e-commerce or mechanisms at, at in any of those three activities. So it could be pure e-commerce organization or partial e-commerce organization. But also we have click and model. Increasingly, many organizations are trying to transform themselves from traditional ways of doing business to modern ways of doing business. They are trying to go online. So those companies that are still in the transition, those are the ones that we call click and motor. So typically, this kind of uh, organization will still have a lot of activities done uh, offline, but also they try to take advantage of the digital technology. So they would say have some accounts in or social media networks where they try to engage their consumers but the application of information technology is not as intensive as it is in pure play organizations classification of electronic commerce so we need to classify different types of electronic commerce and one of the common ways to do that is by considering the participants of e-commerce and this is a simplified version of that classification so e-commerce could take place between consumers that is the exchange happens between consumer and a consumer for instance when you sell things on eBay so it's basically consumers doing exchange between themselves. And uh, likewise, uh, on fin de terno, it's uh, possible for consumers uh, to sell to one another. But also, exchange can take place between consumers and businesses. And this is uh, very common. Most of the examples I've given here fall under this uh, category. But in some cases, 
the exchange could be between businesses and businesses. For, for instance, uh, Rolls-Royce yeah. is connected to more than its 600 uh, suppliers. And that kind of interaction between Rolls-Royce and its suppliers is what we call business-to-business e-commerce. -business, uh, e but also, the interaction could be within the organization, that the uh, an inter enterprise interacts with its employees. Right, and that could be in terms of sharing information, uh, training your employees, and that can be regarded as business to employees, or uh, e-commerce. But because e-commerce has a, turned out to be something that has, brings a lot of benefits, we have seen also governments increasingly apply information technology solutions uh, in their service delivery to their citizens. For instance, uh, here in Norway, like we used to receive documents from governments, like uh, tax cards on the postal mailbox. But we no longer do that, right? It comes online. And many other documents that used to be delivered physically, these days are processed uh, online. So that kind of interaction is called government to citizen interaction. We, we will have a, a topic on this because uh, electronic government has become a, a major topic, especially in the European Union. It, the European Union uh, has made it as one of its uh, agenda, especially as they approached uh, 2020. So we will have a uh, discussion on that. But this is just uh, to, to make a quick classification of that and uh, for you to kind of see of the things to, to come, what we are going to discuss in the coming lectures. But also the government can interact with its employers as well. Just as the way businesses interact with its employers, the government can do the same. But also there could be an interaction between governments and governments. For instance, uh, migration authorities can exchange informa information with migration exchange, uh, authorities in other countries. For instance, the, these days they, they, they take our fingerprints so for security reasons. And that, those fingerprints will be shared uh, between governments for the purpose of uh, identifying people. So that kind of interaction where government agencies in different countries interact with one another electronically, that's what we call government to government e-commerce. And it, this is pretty much uh, what I have explained and there are some examples. On, on this one, on the classification of e-commerce or alternatives. Now, electronic commerce is a huge phenomenon that uh, involves many activities, involves many actors, many processes, and therefore we need to have a kind of framework that summarizes it and provides the basis for our discussion for the rest of the semester. So what electronic commerce does is we will be looking at different uh, applications of electronic commerce. And that could be uh, marketing activities, search activities, banking, procurement, travel, a lot of applications of e-commerce. But these applications have pillars that things that are make it possible for these applications to happen. And one is people, and that is us. You need to have customers, you need to have employees,
Yes, there we go again. So we are talking about pillars that make it possible for e-commerce applications to happen and we, I just started with people and that is the individuals that are involved in e-commerce, whether it's uh, consumers with the, or whether it's uh, employees, but you need to have people for this to happen. Second, you need to have public policy. Just as uh, uh, we hinted on, on Tuesday, that you have different stakeholders uh, surrounding your business that affect or are affected by your business. And w one of these are the authorities, because any business has to respect laws and regulations of the country. So public policy is one of the important pillars of e uh, commerce business. So you have uh, taxation laws, legal uh, regulations, privacy uh, standards, compliance, technical standards, and we'll talk about that. And then we have another pillar, and that is marketing and advertisement. So for transaction to take place, you need to identify consumers' needs, and you need to plan for satisfying those uh, consumer needs. So marketing is one of the important activities that happen in, in a, an organization. Uh, the late Professor Peter Drucker is uh, he's regarded as the father of modern man management. He, once, uh, he was quoted once saying that in any business there are only two, and only two activities, and that is innovation and marketing. And that is because innovation creates goods and services, while marketing make it possible to sell those goods and services. Of course, with due respect, it didn't mean that other functions within an organization are useless because marketing uh, people also need uh, support from other functions. And if you talk to a, a person with supply chain or logistics background, they would say logistics and supply chain is the most important function. And likewise, finance people would say the same. But we will, in this course, we will look into detail in marketing and advertisement because digital technologies have brought tremendous uh, changes remarkable impact on this function. So we will look into detail on that. And also we have support services, like order fulfillment, logistics, uh, for instance, the example I gave with Zalando, that they're doing all the activities online, but also they need agents that can facilitate the flow of the product. These are uh, services that you need to uh, take into consideration. And then we have business partnerships. In today's world, we say a, b a business cannot compete as an individual. You need to collaborate with other businesses because you cannot create value yourself. In one way or another, you have to craft partnerships with other firms. So if you are an online uh, travel agent, you do not own uh, destinations. You probably need to have a partnership with uh, 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 two operators, say in Spain that can actually provide the ground services. If you're a manufacturing firm, you need uh, to have partnership with your suppliers, with uh, your distributors. So basically, you cannot succeed alone. You need to find ways to create partnership. You could have an online business here in Norway, but it might be difficult to penetrate the Swedish market or the Danish market. <laughs> Having collaborative relationship with someone in Sweden or Danish can make it easier for you to penetrate that market. So you need to think about that. Now this brings us to e-business. We have been discussing about e-commerce. And a lot of people tend to use these two words interchangeably, but actually they are different. And e-business is much broader in scope than electronic commerce. We saw earlier that Electronic commerce involves transaction over networks, either on the sell side or the buy side. But e-business includes e-commerce activities, but also it includes processes and activities within an organization. So it's not just transaction with outsiders, but also it includes transaction within an organization. In a way, e-business cutters across the entire value chain of an organization. Now, now, in your book, 
e-business is referred to as digital business. It doesn't mean anything different. They are the same, or they, are, they mean the same, except that digital business has uh, recently become much more popular than e-business. So in terms of usage in the industry and uh, researchers, now they prefer to use digital business than electronic business. So if you, we move back to our diagram. This is what we say e-commerce. Now what digital business or what electronic business is includes the electronic commerce activities as well as the activities within the organization. So things like information transfer between different uh, departments or di different units of an organization or different sister companies within the uh, corporate firm. This would be rec together with e-commerce would form what we call electronic business. So it covers the entire value chain of an organization. If these activities are done online, then that's what we are co uh, referring to as a business. So this is uh, pretty much what I have said, the distinction between e-commerce and e-business. This is the e-commerce is, and this is what e-business is. So for those of you who like mathematics, if you think of it as a set, e-commerce is a subset of e-business. What kind of processes are we talking about? Because we said uh, e-business involves digitization or application of information technology to facilitate organizational processes. There are three main types of uh, organization processes that can be digitized or th that can be transformed uh, into electronic uh, forms. The first one are production processes, and these are kind of activities such as procurement, uh, processing of orders from your suppliers, production planning. These are what we call production processes that can be digitized. And then we have uh, the second category, and that is customer-focused processes. And this mostly include marketing activities that are digitized. So it could be, say, order processing from your customers, promotion of your uh, products, facilitation of payments from your customers, all the marketing related activities fall under that category. And then the last one is internal management processes. So if we are conducting, say, uh, training for our employees uh, online, I if we do recruitment, information sharing, within uh, the organization, that's what we call internal management processes. Drivers of digital technology adoption. So why are companies moved by digital technologies? There are two main reasons. One are related to cost or efficiency drivers, the factors that are related to cost reduction. And these are, as e-business helps to increase the speed with which supplies can be obtained, like you speed up the, the process of interacting with suppliers. It also increases the speed with which you can dispatch the, the products. It reduces sales and purchasing costs and reducing operating costs. And then the second category is competitive drivers. One is customer demand. Increasingly, this is what our customers are expecting today that we expect our uh, like businesses will provide us services online. But the second uh, driver is big, uh, electronic business provide a possibility to offer a wide range of products. As I said earlier, that an online store like Amazon can provide a wide range of products, which is not possible for a traditional uh, the business uh, enterprise to, to do. And the last one is to avoid losing market share. Because electronic business strategy is now the name of the game. If you want to stay competitive, at least you need to do what your, your, uh, your competitors are doing and even exceed what they are doing. So if you want to avoid losing your market share, then you need to consider electronic business uh, strategy because 
This is what the industry requires. And as I can see, it's already two, and the projector has not been very friendly on us, so we will stop there. We have a, about three slides that we can take on the next Tuesday. And just some information. Today I will upload a Facebook business case. So those of you who have uh, the book, you can read it from the book. But if you don't have the book, uh, I've tried to scan the, the case and it will be on Fronta. Of course, you, you can, it will be much easier to read it on a PDF than to print it out. So read that case. We will discuss it next Friday. So we have an, uh, an ordinary election Tuesday, and then next Friday we will discuss the case.